Brian Smith here, and welcome to the Dream Path Podcast, where I try to get inside the heads of talented creatives from all over the world. My goal is to demystify and humanize the creative process and make it accessible to everyone. Now let's jump in. Jason Moore, welcome back to the Duocast, my friend. Brian, thank you so much for having me. We're here to talk about Bill Oakley and how that episode went. We've also got a few other topics, important topics to go through. Mm -hmm. But I'll start off by asking you, what did you think of my chat with Bill Oakley? Well, Bill is an interesting dude. I mean, it's always cool to hear interviews with different writers because each one of them has their own unique approach to writing and has their own process. So I'm always appreciative of guys like Bill Oakley who are willing to share their methods and discuss the fine details of the writing world and all that goes along with it. Like, for instance, royalties and residuals, how they work in the business. I had no idea how that worked. I agree. That was a fascinating topic that I haven't heard other guests talk about, even though I've asked or at least tiptoed around the topic with other guests. I haven't ever been bold enough to say, how do you make money in this business? And Mm -hmm. how do you get paid after you write? And what are residuals and how do those work? But we really got into it with Bill and he was generous and kind to share that type of inside information. And I think it's helpful for folks who are thinking about getting into the industry because that is a burning question. Mm -hmm. How do you make money? What is the sustainability of this business when you're bouncing around from job to job and, okay, oh, you got a job writing for The Simpsons, but now you're writing for another animated show or some other live action TV series. Mm -hmm. When that job ends, do you stop getting paid or is there a possibility that the work that you did can continue to result in compensation. And that's what residuals are. Yeah, And there were so many other topics that we covered with Bill, including the practical topic of productivity. How do you stay productive? How do you get moving in the morning to actually put words onto the page and work focused for several hours at a time? Right. And he had tips for us on that and tips for our listeners and aspiring writers. And that's always a burning question in my mind, because one of the struggles that I have as a human being and as someone who is immersed in social media and the distractions of life in general is that, you know, you have this thing called writer's block, but what is writer's block? Writer's block is a combination of a lot of things that prevent you for whatever reason from putting words on a page. And he has a solution to that. I'm not going to rehash those tips. Listeners can go back and check out that episode if they haven't listened to it yet and listen for those tips. But it was a fascinating chat. And what I really liked about Bill was that he has this side gig, this side hustle of Mm. fast food reviews, which he does on Instagram. Yeah, And that has turned into something that he was not expecting. Now he's considered to be the Gordon Ramsay of fast food by the rap. (laughs) He's appearing on the History Channel on various food shows. He is on the Netflix series, Somebody Feed Phil, and he has become kind of an icon in this arena, which is super fun because it's so different than what he does behind the scenes as a writer. He's actually in front of the camera making content on social media, but also being featured on these Food Network shows. Right. Yeah. Very cool. And it actually makes me want to do something very similar. I was thinking the other day that I would love to do something like that, but with pizza, honestly. Really? And I'm not talking about, oh yeah, no, I'm not talking about major brands like Pizza Hut or Domino's, like find locally owned pizza places and do reviews on their pizza. Are you in? I'm in. I didn't know I was part of this plan, but <laughs> fuck yeah, I'm in. Well, you like pizza. Absolutely. And I like supporting local restaurants too. Yeah. Yeah, me too. And so I, that was just an idea I had the other day. I thought that would be really fun. You and I sit down with a pie and just uh, have lunch and talk about it. Jason, now that we're talking about pizza, I don't think I've shared this with you before, Mm -hmm. but one of my first followers on the Dream Path Instagram account is an account called Piece of Pie Pizza. Mm. And it's a tiny little pizza joint locally owned out of Alta Vista, Virginia. Mm. And they have been following me from the beginning. And they are one of the few accounts that consistently likes everything I post. Nice. And of course, I like everything that they post because they're always posting really delicious looking (laughs) pictures of the pizzas that they're making, photos of their staff. Mm. They're featuring staff that are star performers. They're running out of pizza. 
which I think is an interesting thing to happen in the restaurant industry where they'll just post, hey, we're out of pizza. Hmm. So we're closed. Wow. And I like I like that concept. Like get it while you can. Yeah. Limited supply. Uh-huh. That story is really not relevant to anything we're talking about here, but you <laughs> you talked about pizza and supporting local pizza joints. So I'm going to give a shout out to Piece of Pizza Pie out of Alta Vista, Virginia. Nice. I'll check it out. So Jason, recently we have been getting a lot of love online about our Mark Lanigan tribute episode that launched a couple weeks ago. And I posted one of the many lovely comments that someone made on YouTube Mm -hmm. about what that episode meant to them. And I have to say, I didn't see it coming. No. You and I put this episode together, this tribute episode, and it came about very organically from a place of love in our hearts for Mark's music. We didn't know him personally, but we knew. And it interviewed multiple entertainers and singers and musicians who were in Mark Lanigan's orbit, including Mark Pickerel, who was in Screaming Trees with Mm -hmm. Mark Lanigan back in the 80s and early 90s. That's right. Moby, who featured Mark Lanigan on some of his songs and albums. And of course, Jeff Fielder, who toured with Mark Lanigan for like 12 years. So we put that tribute episode together. And of course, I was really proud of the episode. Yeah. But I had no idea how popular it would become. And it really has taken on a life of its own on YouTube and in the downloaded audio version as well. And so many comments from folks that are thanking us for putting it together. And I'm like, all we did is say how much we love Mark. And we, you know, pulled a few of his songs and cobbled those together and cobbled together a few clips from the interviews with the guests that we talked to about Mark. Yep. But really, Mark Lanigan is the one to thank for the body of work that he put out there. So I look at it very humbly, although I'm extremely grateful for the people reaching out to us online and giving so many positive vibes to us for that episode. And I I wanted to acknowledge those folks, but also acknowledge you because you're a big part of how that episode came together. And you did a wonderful job making it sound like something you would see on primetime TV. I mean, it could have been like a Netflix documentary type of production value. It sounded great. And thanks for doing that. Well, I appreciate that. And, you know, I think what people liked about it was it's truly genuine. You know, that what we were saying about Mark, we, we meant it. You know, we really did love his music. And, uh, you know, the thing about losing an artist that we all love is that it automatically triggers nostalgia and kind of creates a frenzy of sorts on social media. Right. And, uh, you know, it's it's been like that with us. Our tribute has been one of the most viewed episodes on YouTube for us. Right. And we've gotten a lot of positive comments, a lot of likes, you know. Someone like Mark Lanigan, who has been in a lot of our musical consciousness for decades, will always be remembered for the music and all of the fun stories during those times that we experienced. And I'm just glad that we were able to contribute to that remembrance and be part of something that helped others heal and grieve and, or better yet, contributed to helping someone learn about Mark Lanigan and maybe hear his music for the first time. Yeah, I think it did all those things. I I, I agree. I think it did. Yeah. And just like, with a lot of things that turn out to be kind of surprisingly popular or good or meaningful, those types of things don't happen when you intentionally try to make something great Mm -hmm. or intentionally think, you know what, this is going to be the best episode ever. It's always something that you kind of fall into. It's something that happens organically that you never predict. Right. And that's what makes it so special. It just takes you by surprise. Like, Boom, we made this thing, not overthinking it too much. It came straight from our hearts and look at where we're at now. We've got this very special episode that I'm going to remember forever. Yeah, me too. I'm glad we put it together, man. Right on, brother. Well, the next topic is a little more difficult and a little more somber, but not sad necessarily. No. We are here to announce that we are taking a sabbatical or hiatus from the podcast. And what is a sabbatical or hiatus for my listeners? What does that mean to us? Well, what that means is that we're going to take a break. We're going to stop putting out episodes on a regular basis. For the last three years, we have been putting out one episode per week, roughly. Mm -hmm. 
there was a time when we put out episodes without what we call duo casts, where Jason, you and I recap the previous episode. But for the majority of the last three years, it has been consistently a weekly event Mm -hmm. where we have a guest interview, then we have a recap. And recaps for me, Jason, uh, are the best part of this podcast and this whole experience. Mm -hmm. But it's a lot of work. And three years is a long time to be cranking out consistently this type of content. For others, it may not be a big deal because maybe they don't put as much work and effort and energy into it that you and I did. Oh, yeah. But to sustain what we have done over the last three years, it's kind of a burnout. Mm -hmm. It is possible to burn out. And I never want to burn out on something that I love so much, the exploration of the artist's journey. I think it's important work. It's fun work, but I don't want it to become a burden. I don't want it to become something that I wake up in the morning and I'm like, really? I got to do this again? I never want it to be that way. It's not that way now, but I am doing this to make sure that I can come back to it anytime I want and still put out episodes that are special to you and I and uh, not have the burnout make it an impediment for me to come back. Right. So that's a long way of saying we're taking a break. We don't know how long that break is going to be. It could be that two weeks from now or a month from now, there's an interview opportunity Mm -hmm. and we are back putting out another episode. It could be three months, six months, or nine months. The end of 2022, we could be looking at a pretty long break with no episodes being launched. Right. But just know that my heart will always be in this milieu of creativity and learning from creatives and exploring their artistic journeys. And as opportunities arise, I'm going to jump on them and you will be along with me for that ride, I'm sure. Right on. It is sad, but it's also kind of exciting too, because I think whenever you open up space in your life Mm -hmm. and you stop doing something that is really time consuming and energy consuming, uh, when you open up that space, it opens up opportunities for other things. Absolutely. So I'm looking at it as a positive and I'm going to talk a little bit, I hope, about some of the things that we're hoping to do with this additional space in our lives. Mm Mm-hmm. But one thing I wanted to make sure we didn't miss as we're talking about this break and moving on to a different phase is that you and I have both learned a hell of a lot on this journey. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's impossible to cover everything we've learned in this duo cast, but I just wanted to share a few things with you that I feel are takeaways from my last three years. Number one, podcasts are a lot of fucking work. (laughs) <laughs> you know, yes, I, they are. I, I had no fucking idea just how much of me the podcast was going to take right. and command uh, that I give it attention and time and money. And uh, I've never made a dime on the podcast. right? And I never really started it to intend to make a dime. But the fact that I did this free of charge without ever trying to get sponsors because I didn't want to mess with having sponsors control our content or mess with the flow of our programming. Right. It's just a a whole nother racket that I didn't want to get involved in. It was purely for the love of the journey. And another thing I've learned is that everybody's journey is different. So you can't take one episode or a series of maybe 10 interviews with like a film director or a musician and really understand how to go about your own journey, how to venture forward with a blueprint, so to speak. You're never going to get a blueprint on how to become successful in a creative space by listening to interviews like this. That's right. But what I think will happen when you listen to these interviews, at least this happened with me, is that you get inspired by these stories because you realize everybody's journey is different. Everybody gets there via a different path. Mm -hmm. And if there's no one right way to do it, it gives you this freedom to do it your own way. Right. And all you have to do is commit to doing it. You have to, as Stephen King says uh, in his book on writing, ass plus chair equals writing. I've said that a couple of times. I've quoted him a couple of times with guests on the podcast. And it's so simple. Sit down and write and don't 
be consumed with the details of what program are you using to write? Are people going to like my story? Are they going to buy my story? Am I going to be accepted as a writer? You know, all of those questions are going to hold you back. Mm -hmm. And same thing with painting, same thing with poetry, screenplays, film directing, acting, you name it. All the creatives that we've talked to kind of have that same lesson to teach us. And the lesson is, it's your own journey. Yep. And if you never get off your ass to go pursue what you want to pursue creatively, you're never going to get there. Nope. So that's what I found so inspiring about these guests is not the blueprint, but the individual journeys that they were on and their commitment to the craft. Absolutely. Another thing I learned, Jason, just as episode zero recorded about three years ago, indicated all artists, no matter how successful they are, are human. Yep. I think we lose sight of that when we put them on a pedestal and we mythologize them and think of them as sort of otherworldly, like, oh, their talent comes from a place that is sort of gifted to them when they're born. Mm. You know, they have this God given talent and it's something that I can't obtain because I don't have that God given talent. And I've learned that all of these folks are human beings and they've all failed multiple times, spectacularly sometimes in their lives. Mm -hmm, right. So it's what they do with those failures that really defines them as a human being and as an artist. And so when you see their humanity, when you hear it and you make that connection with them, that human connection, whether it's in person like we did for the first couple of years or via Zoom after the pandemic started, you make that connection with them and you realize we're all in this together and we all have the same exact challenges. And so when you humanize these artists, I think it becomes even more inspiring. And when you humanize these artists, it's its own form of inspiration because you realize, well, if they're human and I'm human and they fail and I fail, we're both in the same boat. Oh yeah. We can both do this. What's the difference? Mm. The difference is the commitment. Yeah. It's the 10,000 hours rule, the amount of time that they put in, the dedication to their craft. I mean, I could go on, Jason. There's so many things I've learned. I've learned about teamwork. I've learned about family and friendship with you, what it's like to work with a friend and how to find that synergy of extracting everything that you have to offer as a creative and as a technical guru <laughs> and meld that with everything that I have to offer too, which, you know, I have a different set of skills and how do we bring those skills together? And we always joked with each other that, you know, two half brains make one full brain. Right. And so <laughs> between both of us, we were able to problem solve and get shit done. Yeah. And I think we were being a little bit humble there, but there's some truth to that. But there's just so much that I have gained from this experience. And I feel like, I just feel lucky. I feel like when, when uh, Dr. Seuss says, don't cry because it's over, smile because it happened. Right, right, exactly. That's how, that's how I feel, man. Yeah, well, I feel the same way. You know, you and I have been talking about this for a while, though. We just haven't really let it out. But, you know, we both have a lot going on in our personal lives, uh, you, you more so than I. But you got to realize this is our 167th episode. So, you know, that's 167 weeks, give or take, that we've been pumping out these interviews and doing recaps of those interviews. And that's, that's a really fucking good run for any podcast. I agree, Jason. It's an impressive record. I mean, you can look at some other podcasters and I'm not going to name any names, but there's folks that just crank out like three episodes a week mm -hmm. and you look at the content, you listen to it and you're like, yep, I know exactly how he does it. Yep. Three episodes a week. Yep. He doesn't put any thought into it. The production value's low. Right. The thought that goes into the questions is minimal. Right. You know, cursory. And I feel so proud of what we've created together. The high production value and also the time that we took to make sure that each guest had full editorial control over everything in the process, like the graphics, the show title, anything that they would say in an interview that they weren't comfortable with, 
you know, sometimes their publicist would call back and uh, say, hey, you know, that part in the interview where so-and-so said X, Y, Z, can you take out X? Yeah. And sure, this isn't gotcha journalism. We're not here to try to exploit folks and put things out there that makes guests feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And that's something I'm proud of too, the relationships that we developed with these publicists and with these guests. And a lot of the guests I'm still friends with. Mm -hmm. Chris Kincaid is someone I'm very close with. Yeah. And one of the original guests, just a fantastic guy, and he's got a new movie coming out called Dreaming Hollywood. So shout out to Chris, and that's going to be streaming on all platforms pretty soon. And AJ Eaton mm -hmm. is another friend who directed the Crosby doc. I mean, so many of these folks I'm still connected to, and you're still connected to. Right. Why is that? I mean, some people go through the interview process, and it's purely an act of self-promotion. It's like, okay, this is the press junket day. I've got to get through all these interviews. And sometimes they come into the interview like that, but they leave the interview knowing that we care. We care about the quality of the content, the sound. We want everything about the process to go smoothly. We want them to see that they're being featured in the best light possible. Absolutely. And I think that that goes a long way. So the relationships and friendships are things that you know I'm going to cherish forever, and it's probably what's going to keep me coming back and um, and still thinking about how do I continue to put out content in a way that's going to allow me to be my best self with my family, with my day job as an attorney, as an advocate, and also creatively, you know, because I have things I want to do, and you have things you want to do mm -hmm. creatively that I think taking a sabbatical will open up opportunities to do. So how do we keep this podcast dream alive? I think we just keep the infrastructure in place and we keep our ear to the ground. We maintain these relationships with publicists and guests and we let the universe tell us what to do next. Absolutely. Um, you just never know, right? I mean, you never know what might come around the corner. And, you know, I agree with everything. I've learned so much with this podcast and I learned one of the main things I learned was I actually didn't really know what the fuck I was doing when I got involved. <laughs> I mean, I thought I did. <laughs> Dude, you should have told me that, man. I wouldn't have hired you. <laughs> I know. It's one of those things you fake it till you make it kind of a thing. But no, I knew a little God, bit. Now I find out. Yeah, I knew a little bit. You know, I, I have some experience in radio and production and stuff like that. But man, it turned out to be a lot of work and a time consuming adventure, you know, and that's exactly what it is. It's, it's an adventure. And I'm just grateful that, uh, I'm part of it. You know, I got to hear interviews from icons, people that I grew up with listening to on the radio, Don McLean, BJ Thomas, mm. you know, I got to hear an interview with, uh, Richard Patrick who was, went off politically and just was crazy. And it was, but it was so entertaining and informative, the stuff he was talking about. Just so many really intelligent people. Justine Bateman comes to mind. Mm -hmm. She was so down to earth and so smart and had a lot to say about, you know, her experiences with directing films and her books and just so many guests. Moby, uh, intellectually, just absolutely hooked in. You know, this guy has a major story to tell and I, I got to hear it. So yeah, grateful, very grateful. Thank you for letting me be a part of that, Brian. And, you know, we're not gone for good. You know, we're going to, we're like you said, we're going to pop back in every now and then. Absolutely. And we may pop back in down the road with the same schedule, with a different schedule, mm -hmm. or just intermittently an episode here or there. So keep subscribing. Don't unsubscribe. Right. But, you know, I'm glad you brought up prior guests, Jason, because you were talking about Justine Bateman and BJ Thomas and Don McLean and all these iconic musicians and filmmakers and yeah, you know, TV personalities. The one guest that popped into my mind when you were rattling off all those guest names that really kind of changed my view on what could be accomplished in a podcast forum is my interview with BJ Lederman. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that is the episode where I flew out to Asheville, North Carolina. Never been to Asheville. I'd been to North Carolina in the Cape Hatteras region when I was a kid with my grandparents, but I'd never been to Asheville. And I flew in. And the reason I had made contact with BJ is he actually reached out to me. And this was one of the first times that I did not hustle 
to do outreach to guests. He actually emailed me and he said, hey, BJ Lederman here, composer for the NPR morning edition and evening edition right. theme songs. And of course, I'm a huge NPR fan. Yep. Grew up with it. I knew exactly who BJ was. And I'm like, he wants to be on my podcast. And I, I think I just started it. Yeah. It was one of it the, wasn't that. It was one of the first ones. Yeah. Yeah. It, so I was like, okay, I'm flying to Asheville, North Carolina to do this. And I took my daughter with me uh, who wanted to go on a trip and see that side of the country, Emma. And so we landed, rented a car, and we met BJ at a cafe on the outskirts of Asheville. And he was there with this new girlfriend that he met. He had met her, I think, a couple weeks before. They were hanging all over each other like they were teenagers. It was kind of funny. <laughs> and we didn't start the interview there. We just had lunch at this diner. And I said, okay, what do you want to do? Where do you want to go next? And he said, well, why don't we do the interview this way? Half of the interview we'll do on a hike. Mm. I'm going to take you through the mountains of Asheville, North Carolina. Right on. And I said, sounds great. Of course, I didn't have the equipment for it. I didn't have anything wireless at that point. Still don't. Yet we figured out a way to have him carry his mic. It was an SM58 and I had an SM58. And for listeners, that's kind of like the standard cheap, but very reliable and great sounding microphone. Oh yeah that I used for several years before upgrading. And so I had this long wire, probably 20 feet long for my mic and BJ had a similar wire and we're walking through the woods. He took off his shirt, by the way, because it was really <laughs> hot. So we have this shirtless 60 something guy, BJ Lederman, walking through the forest <laughs> with his bear spray in the back of his pocket. Right. And he's, uh, he's singing, hey bear, hey bear. Yeah. <laughs> and he's clapping his hands and trying to make sure we don't scare any bears. So we're capturing all of this on mic, and it's all part of the episode. And how special that was to be able to interview him in that context, in that setting. Yeah. Beautiful. And, and of course, my daughter was there the entire time taking pictures and documenting it all. And I think some of those photos might be on the website, actually, for that episode page. I think so, yeah. And then the next half of the interview... He said, let's go to a home, not his home. It's an ex-girlfriend's home. And we got there and you could tell she was a little bit irritated. Like, BJ, really? Who are these people? <laughs> He's like, can I use your grand piano? And so we went into the house and, and the, the host, and the owner of the home was very lovely and, and kind to us. She welcomed us in. But you could tell she was like, okay, BJ, all right, what's going on here? So we get in the house. And BJ sits down at this grand piano and he's like, okay, let's do the second half of the interview. And so he played the NPR theme songs that he wrote. He sang some Beatles songs. And I interviewed him standing next to this grand piano, beautiful home overlooking some trees and a forested area. And my daughter again was taking pictures. And I just, that type of experience, I don't think that there's any way to describe how special those types of experiences are. And I had many of them, but the one that stands out that I just described to you with BJ was really, really special. It's something that you can never set up intentionally, talking about organic experiences and just kind of letting things unfold. Mm -hmm. That's how this podcast has gone. And that's how the first couple of years doing this face-to-face -face went. You know, I would show up in people's houses in Hollywood Hills and Silverdale, Los Angeles, and yep. music recording studios with Richard Patrick of Filter and record these interviews and come away with stories that I could not have imagined would be achievable in terms of the narrative and how it unfolded unless I was there in person, connecting with them face to face. Yep. And then we had the pandemic and then somehow we were able to still do it via Zoom. Yeah. Then we had that face-to-face -face interview with Mark Pickerel, and it gave me that little taste after the pandemic of what it was like to be face-to-face -face again. Right. And I was like, gosh, I love this job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love it. And that's why, that's why I'm tearing up a little bit when I'm talking about it is it's, it's, it's kind of bittersweet because it's opening up opportunities for both of us to shut it down for a while, but it's also hard to walk away from. Right. Absolutely is. You know, what are you looking forward to doing? Writing. Good. Writing. I've been emailing back and forth with owner Tukel, 
the film director out of New York City. Nice. And he is producing movies now. He's raising money for films now. I might be investing in some of those films. Cool. I'm going to be writing and sharing my work with owner and trying to get feedback from him. And hopefully one of these days I'll be able to not only have a screenplay for a short film, but also direct that film. That would be great. That would be awesome. And in terms of uh, film production, that's something that I'm really interested in because I think I would be good at it. I think I know enough about the creative process, about good writing, good acting, casting, fundraising, through these interviews with my guests and also just studying it on my own, that I would be good as a film producer. We'll see. I mean, we'll see if there are any opportunities out there to do that. I've had a few opportunities that I've turned down, but you know, when I open up this part of my life, maybe there'll be space for that. But my main focus is going to be writing. That's going to be my family. I'm going to try to focus on my kids, my grandkid, my wife. Three years is a long time to be doing something at this pace, at this intensity that is outside of work and outside of family. So, you know, I want to uh, honor them and, and focus on them as well. And also my job. I've got clients I've got to pay attention to. And so I'm going to be spending a lot of plates as always. I think one of those plates is going to be focused on my own creative adventures. And we'll see where that takes me. Right on. How about you, Jason? What are you looking forward to? Well, personally, I'm looking forward to uh, working on some more music. I have, like I've said before, I have probably four or five different projects that, you know, need to, they need to be finished. I'm a horrible procrastinator. And so maybe this will actually give me a little bit more time to do that. And there's also a possibility that I might be going back into radio, whether it be part time. Really? Yeah, very possibly. Yeah. I've been talking to somebody about it. Not sure yet. We'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, basically, I have a ton of stuff that I could be doing. And so, you know, who knows what lies ahead in the near future for me, but that's pretty much it. I mean, I'm going to miss this. This was, you know, a good opportunity for me, a good learning experience. And it's just fun to do. I mean, you and I, every Wednesday, it was like a launch party, you know, not quite, you know, we're not getting bombed every Wednesday night and, and doing this. We're doing it for fun. You know, it's a kind of a rush, you know, to have it done, get it released, and then hear your feedback from it and recap it. It's always, yeah, the, always a lot of fun. The flurry of text messages on Tuesday evenings <laughs> where you're like, Brian, where are the show notes, man? <laughs> Tell me when the show notes are done. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'll get to it pretty soon. And sometimes <laughs> yeah. it was like 1130 at night. Yeah. And midnight was our, our launch time for the Wednesday episodes. I was a notorious procrastinator for a long time, but toward the end, I got pretty good at, at getting ahead of the game. Yeah. But I am going to miss that flurry of activity on Tuesdays Yeah, where you and I were doing everything to get everything in place. And then of course, Wednesday happens and that's launch day. And so we have to get the audiograms ready to promote on social media. We have to get the newsletter ready That's right. and get that sent out to the guests and have them approve. The audience hears the end product. They hear the episode as finalized and it sounds great and professional, but I don't think we've ever gone into the detail, the workflow of how much goes into each episode, like each stage. There's a lot of steps that go into the visual aspect of the show, the audio parts of the show, the editing back and forth, oh God. the intro clips uh, for the guests, the intro clip from the, the YouTube episode, which is separate my intro that I have to record. And I recorded two separate intros for each episode. It's always the YouTube intro and the audio intro. And you know, maybe I made it more complicated than it needed to be. But as time consuming as that was, I'm going to miss it. Yep. It was really fun to work with you on those. And I'm going to miss you in this context. Of course, we're going to talk to each other. We're going to play music together. Oh yeah. And put out episodes, of course, as needed. But I'm going to miss this back and forth in this bro time. Oh, the bro time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but, you know, we live in the same freaking town, Brian. I mean, it's not like I'm not going to see you again. And we'll work together in the future doing something. It's, you know, I'd, I'm sure I would really like to help you if you get your short film going to uh, help you with music and sound. And, and of course, we'll pop in. Fuck yeah. We'll pop in here and uh, talk occasionally. I have a feeling when you do the score for my film. Mm hmm. You'll get it all done, and then we'll talk about it on mic, and you'll say, you know, when I first got the assignment, I had no fucking idea what I was doing. <laughs> and I'll be like, Jason, why didn't you fucking tell me at the beginning? God damn it. 
Well, I can just tell you right now, it's going to be exactly that. <laughs> because <laughs> i have hey. never scored a film well i've never made a film so we'll be in that together that's it's going to be a great learning experience that's what life's all about i agree well said my friend all right jason it's been a lot of fun it's been a great three years it's not over over of course we're going to stay connected and continue to put out episodes whenever the calling occurs whenever the universe sends us in that direction yep. but until then Let's focus on our own creative projects, our own families, and we'll be in touch. I love you, brother. I love you too, man. Hey, thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If so, I have a favor to ask. Can you go to wherever you listen to podcasts and leave me a review? Your feedback is what keeps this podcast going. You can also check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook with the handle at DreamPathPod. And as always, go find your dream path. 